Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, what a journey. Sydney, Australia, all the way to Higgins Middle School in uh, an easy 26 hours or so. So I'm very pleased and honoured to be here. Thank you for having me. I'll speak a little slowly because my accent may um, fumble you up a little bit, but uh, we'll get through together. Um, the famous uh, Greek philosopher Plato said that the beginning is the most important part of the work. And my beginning on this remarkable journey began about 21,000 kilometres away in my hometown in Sydney, Australia. But the journey really began around 74 years ago, back to the liberation of the concentration camps in Germany of Ravensbrück and Sachsenhausen. Um, this start, this project was really just a gem of an idea I had back in 2018 when visiting Ravensbrück. And after a few conversations with a local historian, Dr. Robert Summer, from Ravensbrück and Sachsenhausen, and a whole bunch of meetings, uh, the Berlin government and both memorials opened up their archives to me to photograph approximately 180 images. Out of the 180 images, we have about 80 that are now slowly traveling the world. So the 14 I'm going to show you are the 14 that Christopher saw last week when I was there for the opening of the memorial for the 74th anniversary. Um, it was emotional and difficult to photograph these, particularly when you're doing them in a concentration camp. But um, the camps were amazing and obliging and open to me. And um, the research that we did and the stories behind these images all come from the original SS camp records of each camp. So the Germans kept records on everything. So with Dr. Summer, we were able to go through each artifact, match it to its original owner, and then to their eventual fate. Um, a quick background, for me, photography is really the perfect medium to convey the prisoner's message. It's their narrative, and I've used the language and grammar of photography to try to do that. Um, it really, I tried to photograph these with a sense of human dignity, when in reality there was really nothing but humiliation and total content for human life in the concentration camp system. Um, my late um, uncle, Nobel uh, laureate um, Elie Wiesel said, I decided to devote my life to telling the story because I felt that having survived, I owe something to the dead and anyone who does not remember them betrays them again. And as a child of Holocaust survivors, this project really did become a personal journey for me. Okay. Um, to give you some real brief context of the camps, uh, the women's camp, Ravensbrück, was built in 1938. It's about 80 kilometers north of Berlin, on the same train line as Sachsenhausen. It was the main camp for women and children from inside Nazi Germany. It was also a training camp for about 4,000 SS female officers who would work in the camp systems around the occupied territories where the camps were. Between 1939 and 45, over 132,000 women and children went through Ravensbrück. Approximately 50,000 of those died through medical experiments, starvation, and disease. In April 30th, the camp was liberated by the Soviets. And up to the end of the Cold War, it was used by the Soviets as a forward operating tank base. So a lot of the barracks did remain, but were used by the Russians military. Sachsenhausen, on the other hand, is only approximately 45 kilometers from Berlin, north of Berlin, same train line. And it was the model camp that they based all their other concentration camps on. It was also next door to the SS training grounds and parade grounds. It was built in 1936, and between 1936 and 45, over 200,000 people were imprisoned in Sachsenhausen um, and its satellite camps. It was also a working camp, which is right next door to the um, Henkel Aircraft Factory. So a lot of the labor went to work on the aircraft factories there. Over 10,000 people died at Sachsenhausen. It was an extermination camp. There was no gas chamber. The gas chamber was added later, but it was very, very rarely used at all. Um, so let's begin then. That The photographs I'm about to show you are really stories of the individual stories of the people, but we marry them to their narratives. And it tells us about the original owner and about their fate. It offers us a silent opportunity for the victims to speak to us with their collective voices and doing so with a sense of honesty and humility. 
Um, I photographed these really these artifacts with a singular focus, so stripping the image down to its simplicity, just the image taken out from its background. I intentionally isolated the um, object from the background, and this, I think, helps us zoom in on the very details of what the object is. The simpler it is to me and cleaner the message is, the more clean and simple it is, I think, to the audience. The strength of these images allows the audience to engage on an emotional level. We, we're displaying these images uh, with no frames, no glass, so we're encouraging you to walk up and touch them and feel them and interact with them. So let's now look at a few of these images that I photographed in the 14th that are on in um, Ravensbrook. The teddy bear, which is actually on the program. This actually is probably the strongest image I took out of all the images. It's the one that resonates with me the most. It belonged to a small little Romanian boy who arrived on the Romanian Eichmann transports of 1944. And he arrived into Sachsenhausen. As he was walking along the entryway with his parents and others on the transport and trying to keep up, he dropped his little teddy bear. As he bent down to pick it up, an SS officer saw him, came up to him, and shot him in the head. First stepping out of line. A, a Miss Annie Sinderman, a German political prisoner, she was also on the same transport. Annie picked up this teddy bear and hid it, and she kept it. So when she was liberated by the Russians, she went on for the rest of her life till she died in 1979, telling the story about this little teddy bear and the little Romanian boy that had no name. Incidentally, since I took this photograph a year ago, when I was in Berlin last week, they've actually now restored the teddy bear completely, so all these arms are all together and his legs are being put back. I mean, he does look beautiful, but on a personal note, I liked it the way it was. But the camps are all about restoration, and they do beautiful, beautiful work. This baby dress belonged to little baby Elizabeth um, Schneider. She was born in Ravensbrück in 1944. Her mummy, Connie van Oten, arrived on the transport from Holland. Her mother worked for the Dutch resistance and was arrested by the Gestapo. Even though she was pregnant, she was still sent. She was born in the camp, and when she was born, the other women tried very, very hard to keep her alive. They went and actually stole this dress that belonged to another child that came in on an earlier transport and dressed her in it. Unfortunately and tragically, baby Sylvia Elizabeth only survived four weeks, um, dying in the camp from starvation. Um, her mother, though, Connie Schneider, did survive, was um, liberated from Mutthausen concentration camp, and returned home to The Hague. She remarried, gave birth to another little baby girl called Miriam, and when Connie passed away in 2014, uh, her younger sister donated this dress of her older sister to the memorial. And actually, it's a very beautiful, beautifully ornate um, dress. It's gorgeous. In real life, it's quite amazing. Someone obviously loved that child. Cybersol ampules. In 1944, Czech resistance fighters ambushed Reinhard Heydrich, who was called the hangman of the Third Reich, and one of the architects of the final solution. Um, having died from his wounds after fighting on for about 10 days, Dr. Karl Gebhardt, who was a surgeon, and also Himmler's personal surgeon, was responsible for his care, was blamed for Heydrich's death, because apparently he didn't treat him with sulfamide um, antibiotics. Gebhardt uh, argued that sulfamide would not have worked uh, to treat his gas gangrene wounds, and he would have died anyway. So to basically exonerate himself, he asked and was given 100 Polish women to experiment on with the effects of sulfamide in Ravensbrück, and they went on to be called the rabbits of Ravensbrück. Uh, Sarah Helm wrote a beautiful book on this, by the way, if you get a chance. It's very well worthwhile reading. Um, basically, he would operate on these women, open them, cut them, infect them with glass, dirt, splinters, pass anything possible to test the effects of sulfamide injections on women. Of course, the only result was that they either died, they had trauma, or there was permanent disability. Um, Gebhardt um, was trialed in 1948 in the doctor's trial and was sentenced to death and hung on the 2nd of June. Uh, this lipstick um, was found in Ravensbrook, and in Ravensbrook, the appearance of health was vital. So women in Ravensbrook would use um, rouge or a little bit of lipstick um, and wipe it on their cheeks to try to give the appearance of health, because health meant you could live another day, because you were useful. 
Um, on the lid, I'm not sure if you can see it, there is the um, Eiffel Tower, and surrounded it are the names of the cities Paris, Chigny, and Warsaw. We think it was brought into the camp on the Polish transport in 1944. This is an urn lid that um, belonged to a Simone Albert. Simone was born in France in a small town of Thursey. On the 2nd of May 1944, it's there, when she was 33 years old, she was deported to Ravensbrück as a collaborator. Five months later, on the 25th of October 1944, she was dead from starvation, being worked to death. We can actually see on the image when she arrived and when she died and where she was from and her birth date. Um, the little urn indicates that the body was cremated three days after she died. It was found at the camp and we feel that um, her family didn't either have the money or the means to pay to get her ashes back because the SS would charge the victims' pair of families to return the bodies or the family themselves were no longer alive. Food was very, very scarce in concentration camps. In fact, the only thing that was offered was a watery liquid soup with little to no protein in it at all. And everyone was issued a cup. And if you would lose your cup, you would get no food, which meant you wouldn't eat, you would die. This cup belonged to Renee Miranda Laval. She was born in Paris in 1908. Miranda Laval studied law, and she worked for the French Resistance. She was caught by the Gestapo and, and, and sent to Ravensbrück towards the middle of 1944. She survived the camp and after her liberation, she became a prominent public rep representative of the victims of Ravensbrück and a chairperson for the French Survivors Organization of Ravensbrück. And in 1965, 11 survivors from 11 countries founded the advocacy organization International Ravensbrück Committee. Uh, uh, Renee Marie Laval was also became its first president and she remained in that role until her death in 1979. And that was her cup that she used in her time at Ravensbrook. This dress belongs to Miss Erna de Fries. She was imprisoned in Auschwitz with her mother. Um, on arrival, her mother was sent straight to the gas chamber. Erna was kept alive and then as a young, young girl, she was moved with a lot of other women in 1943 to Ravensbrook concentration camp. Uh, there she stayed. And basically, the whole, the sad thing about this, she survived the war and um, she lives in Berlin and she's a very young 95-year-old lady. She's very elegant and very articulate. But the, dread, the belt is actually from a handbag strap. And she said that that was the most precious thing she owned because she could tie the belt around her waist and keep her body warm. And the last strap is her waist when she was liberated from, from the camp. So it shows her basically wasting away over those um, year and a half that she was there. And it's tiny. I mean, I touched it, so it was like that big. It's crazy. Anyway, she's an amazing woman. She still speaks today in Berlin, Germany. Bless you. Uh, this is a fork and ladle. I don't know if you can see the bottom of it, but there is the Nazi um, here swastika and emblems on either side. It obviously belonged to an SS officer, an SS officer's family near the camp. It was found after the war in a little village called Haval, which is right next to um, Ravensbrück Memorial. But the scratches came afterwards because we think that families kept it and then tried to scratch off the Nazi swastika and continued to use the cutlery for their own dinner sets which raises a whole bunch of paradoxical questions. Um, it was donated to the memorial about 10 years ago by a local um, family from near the camp. This little Bible, it's only about three inches by 1.8 inches. It was published by M. N. Schultz in 1901, probably in Warsaw. It was smuggled into the camp on a Polish transport by lady. And then she was moved to Auschwitz, but she gave it to a Bulgarian prisoner called Nadia Tita Tanawa. Nadia kept this um, Bible for the rest of the war in its sleeve, and she donated it to the memorial in 1991, just before um, she passed away. And inside, the writing is very, very small. I mean, you need a magnifying glass to read it. I mean, it's absolutely tiny, but it's a very beautiful um, sidor.
Evipan. This was, um, it was basically a narcotic. It was developed by a pharmacologist called Dr. Helmut Wieser in 1930s, who, also inst who instantly also was the modern father of intravenous anesthesia. It was used as anesthetic and was used by over 10 million people before the outbreak of World War II. But after the beginning of the war, it took on a bit of a sinister use. Uh, the Germans would use massive doses of Evipan to kill patients by injecting them directly into the heart. Under the pretense of a false medical exam, they'd make them sit on a table and then inject them straight into the heart. Death was instantaneous. It was made by IG Farben, uh, which owned the brand Bayer. Um, this is actually a reproduction. There is, we can't, the memorial doesn't have any originals, but it's very close to what the original would look like. shoe with a little secret compartment. This shoe, um, Nazis deported to people all over Europe, mainly political prisoners, socialists, communists were pretty high on the list. Uh, they knew that survival in Nazi concentration camps was about finding strength and courage to fight. So together they would hold clandestine meetings and create social communities and political educations within the concentration camp system. So the French resistance fighter Martha de Marceau was smuggled into Ravensbrück, part of the history of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, which is that parchment inside her heel of her shoe. Her comrades Susan Cage and Georgette Kadras read from this parchment during secret meetings to further their political resistance and mental nourishment um, with the women against the Nazis. It was found um, in the camp after liberation. Uh, both, all three women did survive the war. Doctor's medical kit. Um, as we spoke about before, infirmaries were feared and understaffed, with little or no qualified real doctors working in them. In 1943, and with no medical training, prisoner Franz Sarnek, a former electrician, was employed by the SS in Sachsenhausen to work in the medical infirmary as an X-ray technician. Working with other Jewish doctors and nurses, he learned his trade, he learned it really well, and was selfless in trying to work with other prisoners and try to save their lives as best he could, with no real medical training. After the war, he was liberated, he moved back to his town in um, Brandenburg, Germany, where in 1976, the city honored him with a uh, street named after him. He died in 1981. Um, these were his actual the medical kit that uh, he used during his time in the camp. So, to end very briefly, look, it's my sincere hope for all of you that these images you've seen have moved you in some way. That they reach you and they make you think. And I'd like to know if they would connect with you and, and did it work. And maybe even change your mind or perception or even move you enough to share what you've seen with um, other people. That's the message I really have for you tonight and that's what I really, really care about. So if the beginning was an important part of the work, then let's end it with some words of thanks. It's my sincere appreciation and thanks and gratitude to Lisa Mormon, to Dan Eschett, to Erin Lachlan and to Christopher Ray, there you are, and uh, Harry Wax. And thank you all for having me here tonight. It's been a journey, but I've enjoyed every single moment of it. I wish you a pleasant evening. Good night. <laughs>